This program is brought to you by Emory University. I first met Steve in, uh, I guess, in 1984 when I was a medical student. Um, when we would uh, admit patients to Uppergate um, to uh, undergo heart catheterization the following uh, day. Uh, and certainly a lot has changed uh, since then, but um, just some background, uh, you know, Steve was, uh, uh, grew up in uh, Woodbury, uh, Georgia in, in Meriwether County and, and went to Georgia Tech. Um, and for those of us who know him well, he certainly has an engineering mind uh, and uh, that has uh, really um, impacted um, his career and, and all of our career here as far as how he's educated us. Uh, he later went to the Medical College of Georgia and did, did, did his um, remainder of his training uh, at Emory. Uh, he, um, he served in the, in the Army um, and uh, has received awards for his uh, uh, military service. Um, <clears throat> Steve has, has been just an excellent educator um, in so many ways. He, he was just extremely multi-talented. He was uh, used to work in the uh, cath lab. Um, uh, my brother, David, talks about how he taught him uh, heart catheterization um, and was absolutely the best. And I think a number of um, trainees would, would share those uh would share those memories of, of, of training with him in, in the cath lab. He, he directed our outpatient cath lab for many years. Um, I think Steve also brings forth the culture of our group. Um, <clears throat> having trained under Dr. Logue and Dr. Hurst um, and all of the patient oriented um, focus uh, certainly holds through with our group uh, to this day. Um, when, when we think about Steve Clements, we think about someone who sits down on the patient's bed at the bedside, looks him in the eye and listens. Um, and uh, he could potentially spend two minutes in a room with a patient. The patient might think that he had been in there for 30 minutes. And that's a, an amazing trait. He also understands the power of words and what people hear. Um, and he treats everyone like a VIP. One of, one of my colleagues once asked him, Dr. Dr. Clements, you see so many VIPs, you know, how do, how do you handle managing that situation? He says, well, the way to do it is to treat everyone like they're a VIP. Um, and it, there have been a number of gifts made in his honor to, to Emory. Uh, the, there's a Steve Clements endowed chair in the School of Public Health. Uh, Dr. Clements uh, holds the Harrison a chair and um, he continues to work um, in the echo lab and educates our fellows and the staff there. Um, and he's always interested in new uh, technology. I think another um, thing about him is that he understands the power of stories uh, and uh, the power of analogies. I think Steve once told me that analogy is worth more than a thousand statistics as far as getting a point across. And that's what he's gonna do this morning um, when he uh, tells us that a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, so Steve, uh, just um, on, on my behalf, thanks for all that you, you do for Emory. Thank you, Andy. Uh, thanks so much. I remember David so well in the cath lab and uh, David, a great guy. I know uh, he's done a wonderful job down in Tallahassee. So today I'd like to show you some uh, situations that have taught me a lot. And I'm always trying to figure out what our fellows might know and what some of my younger colleagues might know and what they don't know and try to fill in some of those gaps. So uh, here we go. Okay, I have no disclosures. So uh, I look for a quotation that might help a little bit. Education is the kindling of a flame, not the filling of a vessel. Socrates said that, so today we'll try to kindle a few flames. Uh, the first situation was a 46-year-old gentleman who came in that's 
and stated that uh, he had an enlarged heart. He was told he had an enlarged heart, perhaps on x-ray, perhaps, uh, actually he didn't say which side it was. And it's up to you there in the clinic to figure that out. So uh, your brain starts working. Uh, you don't have any prior records. They've been scanned in Epic, but uh, you're not exactly where they are in Epic. Uh, and you ask yourself the question, is this going to be someone with a remarkable appearance? You meet the person, you shake hands with the person. And I'll ask you, do you shake hands with your patients? That's, that's the first part of interaction. COVID has put the damper on that a little bit. Sometimes if you walk in the room and you wet your hands with alcohol and you shake your hands with a, with a wet hand, they know that you have clean hands. So uh, I usually do something like that, and I think that's important. I've actually had patients tell me that the doctor saw them and didn't touch them. So touching them somehow is something you have to do. So you do not have an EKG, echo, CTA, MRI, cath, nothing but you, blood pressure cuff, stethoscope for now. So if you made a diagnosis by shaking hands, maybe or maybe you don't shake hands with your patients. If you do, you might make a diagnosis. So you say, shake hands with this gentleman. You will uh, immediately know what the issue might be. Arachnodactyly. And know that this is an autosomal dominant gene and it occurs in the FBN1 gene, chromosome 15. So this in this situation, the aortic root, which is from the aortic annulus up to the sinotubular junction and up to the distal end of the ascending aorta is enlarged and is specific to that, that area. And when the aortic root or the sinotubular junction becomes effaced, then uh, the aortic leaflets are pulled apart and you get aortic regurgitation, much less a very high risk for dissection. So you shook hands and you already made the diagnosis. What if you uh, shake hands with this patient and you notice something unusual about the thumb and uh, the thumb looks like a finger. And when you see that, it brings to mind a very famous syndrome the holt ram syndrome, and uh, that notoriously is associated with secundomatrial septal defects, as you see in the upper left, with left to right shunting. Uh, it's not a PFO, that's a secundum ASD, associated with fingerization of the thumb, the holt arm syndrome. You see it on 3D on the top right. And uh, you see what we do with them nowadays. Uh, we see the Ampletzer device down in the right lower, sitting above the uh, tricuspid valve. So uh, old arm syndrome. So you may see or feel clubbing. And clubbing is, of course, obliteration and change in the concavity of the angle of lovely bond. Uh, if you look carefully, you might see that uh, there's a difference in the saturations in the toes and the fingers, meaning that uh, the toes and the feet and the lower extremities are getting uh, relatively unsaturated blood. And that comes from one situation. And that is uh, Eisenmenger's physiology with uh, a patent ductus. You can see the left upper, you see the pulmonary artery starting at the top of the screen, going down and entering the aorta, going down to the toes and causing that physiology that I just showed you. Of course, you have to have a very severe pulmonary hypertension with reversal or equalization of shunts. This, uh, this pulmonary artery pressure, right ventricular systolic pressure measured uh, 128, which is in this person was about systemic. So uh, reverse shunning occurred through the ductus. Uh, if you look at the hands, you might see a single line going across a simian line and you know what might be underlying. I've always, always wondered 
when uh, the EKG changes occurred? Well, they seem to occur uh, and be present at uh, birth. So this EKG shows an unusual axis, what Dr. Brinsfield used to call a butterfly loop, uh, big right and back around to the left, biventricular hypertrophy. That pattern of left axis deviation and a right bundle branches looking EKG persists into adulthood. And uh, once you see that line, you worry most about this kind of echo that you see a VSD, ASD, and what is called an AV canal. So this is one of my buddies and uh, he's taught me a lot because uh, he has a very famous syndrome. He has absence of a pectoralis muscle. He does not have he, uh, a large chest on the right. It's hypoplasia of his rib cage. His upper extremity is shorter than the other. He doesn't have syndactyly a fusion of his fingers. He's a very hard worker. Uh, he does have short fingers. Um, so he has a very famous syndrome that I, I found that nobody recognizes much. Um, he's had a very famous operation and um, he does well. He works on the line, works really hard every day. So I might ask you, do you know the name of the Georgia Tech golfer who's on the tour and has this syndrome? So this is called Polan syndrome, and uh, it has those abnormalities that I mentioned, the short upper extremities, hypoplasia of the chest. They can have a lot of different things. And uh, this gentleman had transposition, had a mustard procedure, and he does very well. Alfred Polan described this many years ago, and uh, pediatric cardiologists, adult congenital cardiologists all know about that. So I'm not going to mention the name of the Georgia Tech golfer, but he's on the tour. He's a very, very good golfer and wears a glove on that hand, so you really can't see it. So I refer you back to uh, some work that Mark Silverman and Dr. Hurst did many years ago and wrote a very famous article, which was uh, propagated into the books. It had to do with a hand in the heart or the heart in the hand. And... Uh, uh, the glove-like hand of acromegaly, the warm hand of hyperthyroidism, the short stubby hand of Downs with a simian line, arachnodactyly in Marfan syndrome, fingerization of the thumb, normal grasp of a newborn, which is a wonderful feeling, the cold clammy hand of someone in shock, or the destroyed metatarsal for phalangeal joints of rheumatoid arthritis. And it goes on and on and you do well to study that as time goes on. So a handshake in the general appearance doesn't give you an answer. So uh, it's always good to take the blood pressure in both arms. Uh, especially if there has been a previous surgical procedure or if there's an anticipated surgical procedure. And you may know what I'm talking about. Uh, and which surgical procedure I'm talking about. So in this particular patient, uh, the uh, person working with me came out and said the blood pressure in the right arm was 140 and the blood pressure in the left arm was 70, and she was like alarmed by that. He had a history of coronary bypass, and he came in complaining of chest discomfort. So uh, that got him in the cath lab, and... Uh, Two or three weeks ago, uh, Dr. Nicholson and his group showed a picture similar to this, and it caught my eye immediately. When you inject the left coronary artery, when there's been an IMA present, it's not supposed to reflux like that. And you got to be quick on the trigger when you see this because it's important to follow it up. And if you follow it up, you see it goes all the way up the vertebral and out the arm. So that reminds you of a very famous syndrome and uh, you have to take it from there. So the next thing you do is inject the subclavian. You'll find that uh, there's a tight stenosis and when you inject the subclavian, you're supposed to see the mammary, but you don't see the mammary. So the reason you don't see the mammary is because there's 
retrograde flow there, and there's also a retrograde flow uh, in the uh, vertebral artery. So when you're reading carotid studies, if you do that, and you notice that there's retrograde flow in a, in a uh, vertebral artery, then that immediately thinks, makes you think that the subclavian may be stenosed. And if the patient is about to go to surgery, then you want to alert the surgeon to the fact that when they take down the mammary, they may not have, have much flow. So uh, watch out for that syndrome. And especially in our bypass patients, you need to take the blood pressure in both arms. If you, if you look at this in detail, you'll see the right carotid filling. And then after a delayed period, the vertebral is filling retrograde down into the artery to the left arm. So watch that. Here we go up. Here we come down. Retrograde flow in the vertebral into the subclavian artery. So that's a fixable situation. Can stent that and make angina go away. So what does the left arm have to do with angina? A lot, historically. And maybe because it's compromised by the subclavian steel syndrome. Now at the lower left, you'll see retrograde flow in the vertebral. When our sonographers look for flow in the vertebral, they're always looking for red flow. Red flow. They see it on the right, they go to the left. When they see blue flow, they know to start looking and start tracing it like, like you see in the left lower quadrant, which is an index of retrograde flow in the vertebral, a clue to the fact that the uh, subclavian is obstructed. So what about our patient? Your brain starts moving. You're trying to develop a differential. You at least have an EKG. The EKG is normal. It doesn't help you a little lot. So you ask yourself the question, um, what does this exclude if you have a normal EKG? Does it exclude hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Does it? Well, Oslin Belen told me last week that it doesn't because she just had a patient with a very thick septum and a normal EKG. Really? So it doesn't totally exclude, exclude it. Dilated cardiomyopathy probably excludes it. It's hard to have a big dilated cardiomyopathy and have a normal EKG. Nowadays, they all have defibrillase and have CRT. So uh, there's no left ventricular hypertrophy on this, right or left. So the normal EKG doesn't help you a whole lot. So we say maybe... You're okay, don't worry about it. See you later, or maybe we've missed something. So, and then you order an echo. And as I was sitting in the echo lab one morning, Sniper brought me this image. He said, she says, look at this. And uh, on the right screen, you see blue flow and red flow. And suddenly you're a little confused. And there is a systole on the left with blue flow away from the transducer and uh, diastole on the left, on the right, with red flow toward the transducer. So uh, it makes you think a moment. Now, you know that in aortic regurgitation, there's a lot of retrograde flow. As a matter of fact, you can have a plaque down the aorta a considerable distance, and it can still... Uh, eventually get to the carotid and cause a stroke. So this illustrates reverse flow. And, you know, we use that as a sign of the severity of aortic regurgitation. As you see in this with the reverse flow, holosystolic red flow uh, coming up the aorta there in diastole. If you put PW on it there, you'll see You'll, you'll see retrograde flow, holosystolic. So, but is this the aorta here? Well, uh, no, it's not the aorta. If you look at that carefully, it seems to be a separate vessel going up alongside the aorta, going to a vein, not an artery. The red flow is venous flow. And uh, if you look at this, which is confusing, I've tried to, capture some of the images uh, on the right there. It's pointing toward uh, flow up toward the, the uh, 
the vein and down in the lower right, you see the nubbing of the flow there. Again here, that is joining, going up toward the uh, brachiocephalic vein. And here's what this anatomy was. So this was a partial anomalous pulmonary venous return going alongside the aortic can take on various forms as you see in these middle slides. And uh, the best illustration of it is in the middle uh, showing the partial anomalous pulmonary venous return from the right from the left upper lobe. Now, this occurs in several situations. Uh, it almost always is present in the setting of a sinus venosus ASD, like the right upper pulmonary vein is just part of the mission, missing tissue. And it takes a bit to fix those things. And many times, if you calculate the shunt is not much, these are left alone as it was in this gentleman. So this is what this person had, and this is the flow that was red going alongside the aorta, and that made the diagnosis of partial anomalous pulmonary venous return to the left brachiocephalic vessel. Now, I've asked this question to the fellows, and I'll pose this to you. Didn't, you didn't know what the snowband syndrome is. The reason I know this is because a patient taught me this. And uh, he had it as an infant. It was corrected, and he's done perfectly since then. As a matter of fact, he's a, he rides bucking horses. Snowman syndrome is when you have total obstruction of the venous return, and it causes this kind of picture with very large pulmonary veins not being able to get back to uh, the, where they're supposed to get back. And uh, this is a, requires immediate attention and uh, shunning of the blood the venous blood back to the left atrium where it belongs. So that's partial anomalous pulmonary venous return. If you have a shunt that you can't find, you need to start looking around for this. The CTA group can help you identify this. So we're changing tunes here. And uh, there's a point here I'd like to make about this 45-year-old lady who came to the emergency room because she had syncope and a slow pulse. And this was her EKG. So how would you read this EKG? Well, is this normal sinus rhythm? Well, yes, it's normal sinus rhythm. So it's one thing to identify the findings, and it's another thing to skip to the next level and say, well, this might be so-and-so. So that's what I want you to say at the end of looking at this patient's information. This might be so-and-so. So, -and -so. so uh, sinus rhythm, yes. There's AV dissociation with a ventricular rate of 40. No P waves are conducted. Complete heart block is present. The QRS complexes are narrow and normal. So what could this be? Congenital complete heart block, ischemic complete heart block, Lev's disease, Lenegra's disease, Lyme disease, measles, Corrected transposition, no. Left bundle branch block, right bundle block, no. Something else. Or it might be something else. So when you look at this tracing, there are two things there that bring up special considerations. That is, what about that interval, that P to P interval? And then what about that P wave down there in the lower strip? So what's special about those? So in the setting of complete AV block, the PP interval that contains the QRS is often slightly shorter than the one that does not contain the QRS because the sinus node is stimulated to cause the impulse earlier. And what about the, um, the other one? There's a P wave occurring with a closed tricuspid valve and that causes a Canon A wave. So uh, the second one, uh, if you look at the neck carefully, you will intermittently see these prominent A waves. You can't identify that they're A waves, you just see a, a prominent wave. And most likely that's an A wave. This patient on the right, right lower had an A wave, Canon A wave with every beat. So an echo might help in this situation. So you do a transthoracic echo. You're not sure what's going on. There's a little something in the background, maybe a TEE. 
Robbie Williams did this TEE and he demonstrated these uh, masses up in the right atrium. Many of you may know this patient. She taught me a lot as she taught a lot of others a lot. So these masses in the right atrium seem not to have, they have some respect for borders. They're smooth. They're occurring in the interatrial septal area, although it was more extensive than that. Angiosarcomas, for example, like to come in the right atrium. They don't respect borders. That's the most common primary tumor that we see. Maybe an MRI would help. So here we go with the masses and the MRI. And it, this was red and there was mention of a sarcoma versus a lymphoma. So we got on that pathway pursuing sarcoma versus lymphoma. So what, what do you do to try to prove that? Well, an FT, FDG was done and uh, there was a lot of uh, uptake throughout the right atrium scattered about and um, reactive lymph nodes versus malignancy with a differential. Uh, sarcoma and lymphoma were again mentioned. And I will tell you that later on, the FDG ordered by Dr. Bott was normal. So how did we get to that point? So we still needed some tissue. We tried two percutaneous attempts and they were unsuccessful. I'm sure that because there was endothelium over those uh, areas and uh, the biotome simply couldn't get through that and bounced off it every time. So uh, we, we called the surgeon to get some tissue and the surgeon came up with this. And uh, you see these uh, giant cells that have rims of cells around them. Uh, if you read about this microscopic, there are all kinds kinds of names of cellular reactions to this. And um, the main thing here is the multinucleated giant cells, which uh, suggests that this is some sort of acute inflammatory granulomatous reaction like sarcoid. So sarcoid can cause a lot of different manifestations. Uh, but it really likes to attack the base of the septum, sometimes acutely. And when it does that, it may affect the conduction system. So in this situation, it affected the AV node, but it can affect a lot of other things, as many of you know. It can cause AV block, atrial fib, myocardial involvement in all stages. And another, another important thing is it can, in the longer run, when it settles down and turns into scar, it can cause LB aneurysms and LB wall motion abnormalities in unusual locations, many times basal. So the bottom line of this is when you see a young woman with AV block, normal QRSs, um, think of the possibility of sarcoid. Um, put that first on your differential and, uh, I will pat Dr. Bott on the back because uh, he treated this patient with uh, prednisone and Remicade. He inhibited the TNF-alpha inflammatory response. Heart block went away, went away and that second PET reaction is, uh, is a result of that treatment. So congratulations for leading that patient through this pathway and and doing away with uh, with that sarcoid MRI finding. So that's two patients. So now we're going to uh, talk a little bit about STEMI. So this is one of my pet, my pet EKGs, and I'm going to show you several of them in a moment. It's important when you go to the cath lab, if you have the EKG, that you identify the vessel uh, that might be the culprit, culprit vessel. You might want to shoot the culprit vessel first or second or whatever. For example, in this situation. So this patient actually was having an endoscopy, fibrillated, was resuscitated, went to the cath lab. And in route, he had this EKG 
and uh, the uh, culprit vessel was shot first, which was thought to be the LAD. There's a lesion there that does not look like an acute lesion, so that was stented. And then it's time to shoot the right coronary artery. The, uh, after stenting, the right coronary artery was shot, and oops, right coronary artery is totally occluded. So uh, that was treated also. And actually, that was a non-dominant right coronary artery. So you don't have to worry about those arteries because uh, they don't cause trouble. Well, this one caused the patient to fibrillate. So they are important. So the patient was sent up to Emory because of fear that more problems might arise. And GI bleeding, aspirin, plavix are not a good combination. So... Uh, he had missed a couple of doses of Plavix in the midst of bleeding. So uh, I was sent up to the CCU in case something happened. He could have surgery or another intervention. So I, I went in to see him in the morning in the CCU. He was fine. I walked out the door and the nurse just screamed, says he's about to jump off the bed with chest pain. We did an EKG and there's this EKG. So I uh, was, oh no, uh, we've already seen SC segment elevation once in the Precordial leads. Now we have it again. So uh, let's go to the calf lab. And now he's included his LAD. So that was opened by Dr. Rab, who did a great job. And here we go with the first tracing with occlusion of the right with SC segment elevation in the precordial leads and down the bottom, occlusion of the LAD with SC segment elevation. They have a little con different configuration. They probably, this was very acute. It just happened. So uh, on the left is an occlusion of the right coronary artery. On the right is occlusion of the LAD. So uh, if you look at those vectors, that vector will be pointing a little bit to the right. If you move over to V3R, you'll find it there. But uh, if you plot the vector out, you'll, you won't need that. That used to get Dr. Hurst all upset when you use those V3R leads. And uh, this is from his book on vector cardiography with the SC segment vector down at the bottom there. So, uh, so that's uh, occlusion of the LAD and occlusion of the right in the same patient. So, uh, so here's another patient who had angioplasty of the right coronary artery. He goes back to 4G after his angioplasty, and the student nurses uh, say, "Look, uh, this patient uh, is having pain. He's got ST segment elevation in the precordial leads." So they call a doctor. And um, I'm not going to mention SBK's name, but, uh, and he says, send him back to the calf lab. So he goes back to the calf lab, mainly looking at his LED, they go over to the right and they find that he has occlusion of an acute marginal, which is often part of the right coronary artery. So there is something called the white bear syndrome that Dr. Hurst propagated. And uh, that basically, uh, says if you tell someone to stand in the corner and think of anything but a white bear, all they can think about is a white bear. So that's also, according to Miriam Sawan, told me that's a, the ironic process theory. And it's true because once we get it in our minds, we just can't get rid of that and we start acting on it. So here's another patient that came to the emergency room with chest pain and this EKG. Of course, look at the reading, it's an acute MI. And uh, he goes to the cath lab. Uh, I believe it was Dr. Rabb that took him to the cath lab. And then they injected the culprit artery first or what might be the culprit artery. And the culprit artery or the LAD is open. And uh, the right was totaled and Tanvir opened up the right beautifully. And uh, that was another example of SC segment elevation of the right precordial leads that, that causes uh, one to think about the left. So then once you think that you know everything, you encounter this. So I was sitting in the lab one day and uh, Delia Robinson brought this down and says, there's a man up on the seventh floor who has this EKG and says, oh my gosh. And uh, so the question is, what's going on? He had acute lymphoblastic leukemia. He'd been treated. He was not having chest pain then. His troponins were 30. See, what would be the next step? So, well, I took that EKG down to the calf lab and um, 
the fellow saw it and they were ready to go. So we brought him down to the calf lab and we shot his coronary arteries and they were beautifully normal. We looked at his echo, his right ventricle was hypokinetic. What would you do next? Maybe a biopsy. We did a biopsy and he had acute myocarditis that seemed to have a predilection for the right ventricle. So we moved to the CCU and you might wonder about what kind of arrhythmias he had next. So we had some ventricular arrhythmias and in V1 they were down. So that meant they were left on a branch block and they were coming from the right ventricle. He was treated with beta blockers and did fine. And his right ventricle recovered as they treated him with prednisone and continued to treat his leukemia. So quite a remarkable EKG. No Q waves in the precordial leads, but dramatic SC second elevation. So the points to remember about this is that right ventricular infarction is out there. It's important to identify it. Notoriously, it accompanies inferior MI, and notoriously, it's associated with SC second elevation, V1 through V3. Inferior MI and hypotension makes you think about it. Look at the neck veins if they're up. There's trouble ahead. Non-dominant right coronary arteries can be a problem. They can cause VF and manifest. One manifestation of myocarditis is uh, something that somehow shows up predominantly in the right coronary artery. So the change of subject quickly. Um, it's important to know a little about the cardiac skeleton. Probably ought to be able to draw it. And the cardiac skeleton has part of it, the mitral aortic curtain or the mitral aortic intervalvular fibrosa. And in the left upper, you see the mitral curtain uh, circled in red. Uh, it is in here in this. It is not showing up much here. It is here in this one. It is here. It is here. There's a conduction system. There's a conduction system. So that can cause trouble. So this was a 46-year-old gentleman who had lots of GI issues and presented with fatigue, chest pain, and lower back pain and fever. His blood culture was positive for an enterococcus. And he had this echo. Now I chose this particular frame to show you how confusing this can be. If you look in the center of the screen, the uh, aortic valve is not normal. Actually, that valve had vegetation, but what in the world is this? If you look at this, you'll see uh, during the TEE, we sample up in the left atrial appendage and the left upper pulmonary vein, we get this dramatic turbulence in pulse wave Doppler, and that corresponds to these images on the right in the cath lab. So that on the left corresponds to that on the right. In the cath lab, if you put a balloon in, blow the balloon up, you'll see this giant V wave here. If you don't watch out in the CCU, if you do it there, you'll get this confused with that. You got to watch this late peak to the V wave associated with mitral regurgitation. And it's important as time goes on when you see this on echo. So, what is it like in the cath lab? Um, what might I see if I did this and uh, try to correlate all these? So, here's a 3D image of that patient. And I showed you, chose this 3D image because, because you're looking at this on FOSS. And this is the patient you saw before. And this area is very abnormal. And if you go back to that, you said, Jiminy Willikers, there's a, uh, there's a balloon on the anterior mitral valve leaflet. But the money shot shows there's a hole in the mitral valve anterior leaflet just below the cardiac skeleton. So that's the money shot. There's a ton of aortic regurgitation. This kind of finding is a mitral valve aneurysm is thought to result from aortic valve endocarditis, blasting the mitral valve, disrupting the endothelium, and uh, causing uh, uh, the layers of the mitral valve to be taken apart all the way to maybe the A area over here, the atrialis area over here, and causing an aneurysm. But of course, endocarditis is present, the mitral aortic curtain is in question, and other questions come up as to when you start repairing these. Can you put in two valves, one individually or not? Another patient with hokum and multiple other illnesses, seen at the cab and Dr. Bargava helped with this one, had 
was sent over here for help with her hokum. And uh, when she got over here, a day or two later, she developed fever and culture showed staph. So the EKG showed signs of hokum, tremendous hokum. Something a little unusual about this area right here. We know there's a lot of aortic regurgitation. You see the hokum, see the aortic regurgitation. And then things changed. After the blood cultures were positive, a few days went by, and the echo changed to show you that view again. If you look carefully, you can see something here. It's a good example of how you see something on 3D that's totally clarified on, uh, on 2D. Something expanding in here. We're looking for the money shot I showed in, showed you in the other one. That's the mitral valve's been disrupted. There's hokum physiology. There's a ton of AR. There's almost like uh, the kind of jets you see with Austin Flint. And uh, so uh, as time goes on, that erodes and uh, aneurysm of the mitral valve develops. So what is a commando procedure? That's what the surgeon thought of. And uh, commando procedure, I've asked this question around, most people don't know what it is, but uh, it's when you're faced with disruption of the mitral aortic intervalvular fibrosa, and, uh, and you have to reconstruct that to put it in there. Luckily with these patients, uh, you don't have to uh, they did not have to do that, but they were prepared to do that. So uh, if you move over a few millimeters, you'll encounter the mitral aortic intervalvular fibrosa, the mitral aortic curtain, and this famous abnormality called uh, PMAF, in which right in here, that vulnerable spot, in contrast to down here, gets involved, and you can get various uh, various abnormalities in that area. We had one similar to that one time that we closed. It was not infectious. It followed aortic valve replacement. And uh, you get some unusual images like this with pieces all over the place, with flow going into this cavity, coming back through here and going down here and mimicking aortic regurgitation, which the patient did not have. You can count the pieces to tell which way the blood is flowing. And that's what this patient had. Mimics, mimics AR, that, and that is what I call a PMAF, another vulnerable area of the heart. So you've heard about partial anomalous pulmonary venous return, the hand in the heart, sarcoidosis with narrow curiosis, a complete heart block in a young woman, STEMI and RV infarction, myocarditis predominantly showing up as right ventricular involvement, mitral valve aneurysm, mitral valve aneurysm and hokum, and PMAF. So with that, I'll stop. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Clements. That was mm -hmm. wonderful. And uh, just really enjoyed all the images. I know you do this every year and just love it. So thank you so much for taking the time to put, put all of that together. While we're waiting on questions, and please uh, either text me or type them in the chat or unmute uh, if I don't see your hand. Um, I have a question about the myocarditis case that you showed. What was the, um, so, you know, after they had the cath and the coronaries were open, the RV was down on echo. At what point did you send that patient back to do the biopsy or, uh, you know, if was the patient stable and, you know, could, could, you have pursued MRI, or I, I'm just curious as to what was the reason that a biopsy was pursued? Uh, after the cath, the biopsy was done. Uh, I don't think that this patient had an MRI. Um, may have, one might have gotten a lot of information out of a PET, uh, FDG, uh, or an MRI. Um, um, which I don't think we had either. Uh, once we saw that, those lymphocytes in there, the the heart failure group and uh, the hematologists got together and treat, continued treatment of the leukemia and gave prednisone and the patient uh, rapidly improved. Yeah, so Steve, the, other this thing, is, the other thing that could be done. Steve, this is Andy. I don't I don't know that case, but um, when I saw you present it, my question was, 
whether that patient had received an immune checkpoint inhibitor. Um, and uh, those the immune checkpoint inhibitors can cause just catastrophic uh, myocarditis. And that's something that will appear on board board questions. So certainly something that we see. So I, I can't I can't answer that one. But if, and, if a patient, if, if a patient, acute is, lymphoblastic leukemia, whatever. Yeah. If, Go ahead. if a pa if a patient is getting an immune checkpoint inhibitor, and they start going sour, um, they they can uh, that that has a very high mortality, uh, and and yet really have to get them moved to a center where they can be taken care of. I was also struck uh, by those uh, EKGs that, uh, you know, it can be, we all think it's the LAD, but it ends up being the RCA and, and the same thing that happens with even ST depressions, right? You can never tell. And that's the take home point for the fellows and the trainees who've joined us is that you, you can't tell the territory uh, based on the EKG. Yeah, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for the day that uh, one of the fellows runs up and says, "Guess what? Uh, the ER called us about this possible LAD, and uh, and we told them it was not that. It was a right with right ventricular infarction, no initial force abnormality, and uh, that that haven't ha hasn't happened yet, but one day it might." Steve, this is Robbie. Um, couple Robbie. couple comments. Great as always. Um, with your permission, I'm going to start referring to PMAVES as the Clemens defect from, from <laughs> going out. That's okay. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, Robbie and I have talked about this so much, he's probably tired of hearing me say PMAF. Never. <laughs> you won't be surprised. I do know the name of the golfer uh, from Georgia. Uh, I, I knew you did. His initials are BM. Uh, yeah, um, I, I did not mention his name. You, that's right. Yeah, for HIPAA, HIPAA compliance. That's right. Um, the other thing is, I, right, I did take care of that lady with the sarcoid uh, up in her right atrium. Um, and you're right. I mean, it was, it was, we were pretty, we, we had thought she was going to have an angiosarcoma or something at first. I, although the, you're right, the complete heart block, we should have probably been a little more on the sarcoid. Once we did that TE and saw those very discrete masses, right, she actually went to the OR for for biopsy um of those and the the surgeon got in there and was expecting to see tumors and just saw what looked like sort of normal cardiac tissue just sort of inflamed and swollen i suppose but um that's how we ultimately got the the biopsy of that of that atrial tissue then up showing sarcoid so um a much better result than we were anticipating for that for that young woman so Thanks to Kanalbot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He took good care of her. Right. Steve, Andy, again, I just wanted to comment that when you're talking about blood pressure in the left arm, I, I recall many years ago, there was a patient who had chest pain, exertional, positive uh, nuclear stress test, had had a cath, and uh, the uh, prior grafts were open, including the Lima graft, um, and uh, the patient got referred up here and um it actually ended up that they had they had crossed the stenosis in the subclavian with a catheter and, and it shot the lima but they had missed the uh uh the, the subclavian uh, uh stenosis so um that that always uh you know reinforced in my mind that the importance of taking the blood pressure in the left arm right especially if they had a cabbage yeah so i uh, so I appreciate all the comments, and I, I see it did uh, make folks, it reminded them of previous situations that they've encountered, and uh, it was very good, as you, as you all point out. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining, and don't forget to get your CME, and I'll see you next week. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.